<clears throat> Thank you. Speaker today, Pearl Eliadis describes herself as a pracademic. You divide your time between the practice of law and academics. As a senior lawyer, she has led complex global projects on human rights, national institutions, and democratic governance. She has uh, worked on uh, missions for the UN and other multinational, multilateral organizations in China, Ethiopia, Nepal, Rwanda, Sri Lanka, Sudan, Tajikistan, and Timor-Leste. So you've been around. In Canada, her clients include officers and agents of the parliament, human rights institutions, and civil society organizations. Pearl is an associate professor at the Max, School, Max Bell School of Public Policy at McGill University, and she lectures at the Faculty of Law, where she teaches a course on democracy and dissent a full member of McGill's Center for Human Rights and Legal Pluralism. And she's published ex extensively on human rights, public policy and democratic governance. Uh, if you take a look on YouTube, you'll find that she is a frequent commentator in the media on a range of human rights issues. Pearl serves on several boards and advisory groups and has received the Human Rights Changemaker Award from Equitas. She has received the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal for the, from the Government of Canada. She's been the Woman of the Year in 2009 for the Montreal Council of Women, and the Canada 125 Commemorative Medal has also been awarded to her. In 2014, her book, Speaking Out on Human Rights, won the Huguenot Society of Canada Award from Freedom of Expression, which is an Ontario Historical Society, a graduate of McGill University and the University of Oxford. I'm very, very happy to present Pearl Eliadis. Pearl, go ahead, and we're looking forward to hearing from you. Thanks very much, um, Jim, and uh, thanks to the Rotary Club of Westmount for inviting me, and especially to Tony, uh, who's a longtime friend, and his support for many charities and good causes uh, over the years has been very generous and certainly an inspiration to me and my family, who Tony's known for a long time. So thanks, Tony. Um, so I was asked to talk about the uh, conflict in Ukraine. I pitched a couple of possible ideas to Tony and to Jim when we were setting up, and uh, I understand that this is an issue of particular interest to this group. So with your permission, that's what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, and a special hello to Jill Hugeson, who I see on the call, who we were classmates together at uh, the Faculty of Law at, at McGill many moons ago in what my daughter describes as the ancient times. Um, so I know I know this club has been uh, involved in raising funds and providing relief supplies uh, in Ukraine, and I noticed with interest when I was trying to find out a bit of information out about the Rotary Club's work um, that it has a commitment to truth and fairness, uh, goodwill and better friendships. And so I'm going to talk a bit about these ideas, uh, especially truth and fairness as yardsticks when we look at what a legal perspective can offer in assessing the competing narratives about the Ukraine-Russia conflict. Now, you know, truth and, and fairness uh, may be things that are, um, um, you know, everybody agrees in principle on them, but, you know, in reality, they're highly contentious. Much depends on perspective. And we should be skeptical in the absence of facts about what well-accepted narratives uh, appear to be offering us, however obvious they might seem. So I'm going to start with a little clip. I understand that I've been made a uh, I've been made a co-host, so I'm going to try to share my screen for a second because I'm going to show you a clip I often uh, use um, with folks when I'm talking about the importance that perspective can bring on a particular uh, issue. So just bear with me for one second as we uh, get the technology up. <clears throat> okay, can everyone see that? Can I get a nod from someone? Yes, ma'am. Yes, thank you. All right, so let's go. There you go. It's 30 seconds long. Okay. Can you share the sound? Because we don't hear it. Sorry. Sorry, I've got to start. I've got to start again. Hold on. 
sorry, just give me one quick second. Let's try that again. An event seen from one point of view gives one impression. Seen from another point of view, it gives quite a different impression. But it's only when you get the whole picture you can fully understand what's going on. So that's a little, I hope everybody heard that this time. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so that's a little uh, blurb that I often use because I, I find it's um, uh, a very thoughtful way of and simple way of thinking about how different perspectives can fundamentally change what we think is is going on. And so when organizations like this club and others raise funds for one side of a cause or another, uh, of course, you're taking sides, right? And so this raise important, raises important questions about what the truth is and what is actually fair and whether or not you've made the right decisions. Um, so one of the things that good policy analysis and lawyering does uh, do uh, is to bring together different perspectives, multiple perspectives, diverse intellectual uh, and different kinds of diversity in different disciplines um, that bring together different kinds of truth finding and forensic or investigatory techniques to develop stronger and more coherent pictures of what is actually taking place. And so when we consider the policy implications of intervening in humanitarian interventions or even sanctions on another country that claim to be acting claims to be acting in its own interests or is protecting its own people or claims to be regaining or retaining historic territory, what makes us believe one side or the other? Uh, other than what we've been shown in the media. What values should we rely on and how do we know that the story won't change in important ways if our context changes, just as you saw in the clip that I just showed you. It's pretty clear that we're living in one of the most insecure and troubling periods since the 1960s, if not since the Second World War. Um, the United States internecine political conflicts have sapped a lot of its moral resolve and probably legitimacy. Liberal democracies are struggling to recover from the ravages of a two-year pandemic. Uh, I don't need to tell all of you uh, what the implications of that have been. Uh, climate change, of course, uh, women's reproductive freedom that's uh, under assault in, in a number of countries. Uh, and for the purposes of this conversation, there's also been a retreat for the, from the rule of law and therefore democracy. And that extends to human rights, anti-corruption, free and fair elections, um, and the values, of course, of the Bretton Woods institutions that sustain global integration and encourage economic cooperation. Um, I don't think examples, uh, many examples are needed, um, but you know, a glance in virtually any direction provides depressing evidence. China. Uh, of course, uh, East and West Africa under the scourge of groups like Al-Shabaab and Boko Haram, um, Central, uh, Central Africa with the Rwanda con Congo conflict that's ongoing, the Middle East is a mess, um, Brexit has thrown a monkey wrench in Europe's works, uh, and the far right is rising again in Italy and in Spain. Um, and this, of course, brings us to Russia and Mr. Putin. Uh, Russia's claim that it invaded Russia, be, uh, invaded Ukraine because it had to stop a genocide and that it was protecting Russians is a flagrant example of this kind of allegation. It's something that we uh, sometimes call a mirror accusation because it weaponizes the very practice that the accuser itself is engaged in to point to its adversary and then to justify its own behavior. More on that in a moment. Um, among authoritarians, Putin is arguably in his own category. He's rumored to have gone down the rabbit hole of czarist aspirations to recapture the greater glory of an imperial Russia and his so-called special military operation, and I'm going to use that term in air quotes uh, throughout this talk, um, has resulted not only in the invasion, apparently uh, unprovoked, as I think we'll see from the evidence in a moment, um, but has also destabilized Europe, challenged uh, NATO, uh, and unleashed a humanitarian crisis. Uh, and today marks six months uh, into the conflict with Russian forces continuing their military push on several fronts, 
and the Russian ambassador declaring uh, late last week or early this week that talks had basically fallen apart. So how do we test Russia's claims? Um, the capacity to undertake investigations is limited during military conflict. It's even somewhat limited during um, post-conflict situations. I've worked in some of these uh, areas. I, I don't purport to be a security expert, uh, but certainly working even in post-conflict situations or where there's sort of lingering, uh, lingering conflicts that are ongoing in the field makes these uh, kinds of uh, investigations and inquiries very difficult. Um, but I'm going to offer some answers, uh, or at least attempts at answers from a legal uh, perspective, understanding that there are other perspectives, uh, and of course, other disciplines that are available to provide answers. Um, and, and I think in these contexts, law matters, because it, it, it really is ultimately the arbiter of disputes that is recognized in liberal democracies uh, and it's the and the rule of law is really the only way forward if anything resembling justice and the way of life we all value um, is is uh, to continue so I'm, I'm going to focus on the claim that there was a genocide in Ukraine uh, perpetrated against ethnic Russians and if true that would have served as a pretext uh, for the invasion um, now, if there had been a genocide uh, against Russian speakers, that would have probably justified some form of intervention by third party states uh, to the genocide convention, or at least some form of multilateral action uh, convened through the UN or other, uh, other bodies. Um, Ukraine claims uh, that Russia itself based its special military operation on Article 1 of the Genocide Convention, which allows for the prevention and punishment of genocide. Um, Ukraine asked the International Court of Justice uh, shortly after the invasion to actually and formally declare that no acts of genocide as, as defined in the Genocide Convention had actually taken place in the two regions uh, of Ukraine that were affected, the Luhansk and Donetsk regions. Um, the Ukraine government provided documentation and witnesses to support its claims that no genocide had in fact taken place, uh, while the government of the Russian Federation actually failed to appear uh, before the International Court of Justice uh, in separate documentation. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on this issue of jurisdiction, but Russia intervened to say that the ICJ had no jurisdiction. And this might sound like a technical or kind of lawyerly trick. Uh, in fact, issues of jurisdiction are really fundamental. Uh, they're as old as law itself, uh, because they're all about how law is actually exercised and the authority to do that. And I'm not going to spend any time talking about it other than to say uh, that the, the um, jurisdictional argument was, was uh, rejected. Uh, in part because the uh, International Court of Justice has jurisdiction over disagreements uh, and claims, differing claims and disputes that are brought by parties to the United Nations, which of course both uh, Russia and Ukraine are, and they're both um, um, ratific ratifiers of the Genocide Convention. So that creates a foundation on which um, uh, the International Court of Justice was allowed to intervene. And a lot of you may not know what the ICJ is or what it does. Um, not many of us spend a lot of time thinking about these things, but essentially it's the world forum of the United Nations where states can go to have their disputes uh, addressed. Um, so based on the evidence that was presented for kind of important areas or facts come out uh, that demonstrate the link to genocide in the Russian military actions. Um, first, uh, since about 2014, the Russian government referred repeatedly and publicly to acts of genocide in Ukraine. This matters because uh, in its submissions around lack of jurisdiction to, to the ICJ, Russia actually said that, in fact, there was no dispute between Russia and Ukraine on the issue of genocide. And therefore, that the Genocide Convention was irrelevant and that you couldn't therefore glue the Genocide Convention to the ICJ to give it jurisdiction. Um, it's kind of an unbelievable claim in the circumstances. I can see some of you kind of looking quizzical. Uh, it's, it's, it was a very uh, odd argument, but, and, 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 you know, shame on the lawyer who came up with it. But in any event, um, 
uh, the, the data showed that since 2014, Russia had repeatedly referred to public and publicly to acts of genocide. Second, that an investigative committee of the Russian Federation, which is an official state organ, had instituted criminal proceedings against high-ranking Ukrainian officials for the alleged commission of acts of genocide. Third, on the 21st of February uh, 2022, just before the invasion, Mr. Putin had described the situation in Donbass as, and I quote, a horror and a genocide in which almost 4 million people, uh, which 4 million people are facing. And three days after that, on the 24th of February 2022, Mr. Putin announced that Russia was taking action in accordance with Article 51 of the UN Charter, uh, which claims self-defense and its obligations of mutual assistance with the Donetsk and Lugansk uh, regions, in which he reiterated allegations of abuse and genocide by the Kiev regime, which had uh, allegedly been on ongoing for eight years. So. Uh, as absurd as the argument there actually was dispute was no dispute about this may have seen the court needed to take it seriously and needed to address it and was able to do that in a pretty systematic way. The court rendered its decision on March 16th um, and in short observed that the genocide had in fact clearly been raised by both parties to the conflict and that even if Russia had not itself formally invoked the convention, uh, the death and destruction resulting from the invasion uh, at very least met the preliminary tests for what was being asked for in this case, which were something called provisional measures, kind of a holding pattern uh, that would hold in place until the ICJ uh, actually gets to the merits of the case. So provisional measures require, and the lawyers among you will recognize this um, in terms of similar tests around injunctions and other kinds of pro provisional uh, measures, is the harm irreparable? Um, is there a matter of urgency where this kind of intervention uh, by a court would be appropriate? And because of the damage to infrastructure and loss of life, uh, the court decided that in fact uh, it was. So all well and good. Um, a couple of uh, days after the court's decision, the UN General Assembly then expressed its own concern about reports of attacks on civilian facilities like residences and schools and hospitals and the impacts on vulnerable people like women, old, older people, uh, people with disabilities and kids. Um, now it's obvious, and some of you may be thinking this already, that this is all well and good, but Russia has not even begun to suspend military operations in Ukraine and anyone watching the events will know that Russia has not even attempted to uh, uh, apply, comply, or even address uh, the legitimacy of the court's order. And this raises important questions about what the point of these international institutions is and why the rule of law matters. Um, and, and in response to this, I think I'd say that, you know, justice is an iterative process, which means that preliminary judgments like these ones, like the provisional order issued by the ICJ have important implications because they actually generate le legal obligations on states and can serve as the basis for future decisions after peace has been reached. The decisions may serve to support the indictment of specific individuals later on before the International Criminal Court if it uh, gets jurisdiction, that's a whole other issue. Um, and it also deflects the inevitable later claims that accused persons or implicated countries may not have even known or not been aware, we didn't know, we had no idea uh, that their actions were illegal or that they had any basis to reasonably believe that genocide was indeed occurring in Ukraine and therefore supporting their actions. Um, this decision also supported the mirror accusation thesis that I mentioned earlier, namely that, you know, there's mounting evidence that the perpetrators of the crimes against humanity, genocide, and indeed the crime of aggression have been committed by Russia and not Ukraine. Um, turning to sort of civil society reports, and I'm going to close with this, uh, the evidence that Russia is indeed the perpetrator uh, and not the other way around in terms of Ukraine includes uh, the instigation and incitement of, of genocide, uh, hate propaganda and hate speech that actively denies uh, the existence of a Ukrainian identity and legitimacy of a Ukrainian state, 
uh, that dehumanizes Ukrainians as subhuman, diseased, or responsible for the sort of general decline of, of uh, Russia's stability and indeed the stability of the region. It is true on the denazification claim that many of you may have heard that Russia, that Ukraine has a well-documented problem that Russia has, has expressed concern about for some time with the extreme right. Uh, many European countries face similar challenges uh, in addition to Russia uh, and have been struggling with managing extremism. And I'm, I'm not aware of any doctrine in international law that would actually uh, justify the invasion of another country on the basis of the existence of right-wing elements, however vocal they might be. And if this were true, uh, Russia would also be in its rights to uh, invade the US and for that matter, uh, Canada. Um, framing the existence of an independent Ukraine as an existential threat to Russia uh, and com you know, comparing it to Russia's fight against the Nazis in the Second World War um, uh, you know, is another element of this idea of delegitimizing uh, Ukraine as a legitimate uh, actor. Uh, evidence that the uh, Russians have perpetrated uh, genocide uh, include the Bucha mass massacre in uh, the spring of 2022, where 1,300 civilians were rounded up for mass executions, uh, shot at close range, hands tied, evidence of torture. Uh, Russia, by the way, has denied its involvement. Uh, there have been deliberate attacks on shelters, humanitarian corridors, and evacuation routes, and despite the recent easing of some grain exports, uh, evidence, little evidence that sieges and bombardments are going to stop. Um, the destruction of vital infrastructure that supports civilian life um, has taken place. Uh, there have been widespread allegations of sexual violence, including rape and gang rape, and the forcible transfer of children to Russia. So in closing, I would say that the only real possible solution for multilateral agencies uh, like the UN is to continue its dialogue and efforts to cease hostilities. Um, and it appears that Western countries that have been supporting Ukraine are making the right policy decisions, in my view, uh, based on the evidence that we have so far. Dialogue will only go so far when the other side isn't listening. Um, I've got two decades of experience working with the UN, and I'm the first to say that I know it's a deeply flawed organization. Uh, but so far, I believe that it's uh, the best multilateral option we have for preserving human rights and maintaining human security, working with a number of international institutions and ensuring that the International Criminal Court, the ICC, uh, and other ins multilateral institutions continue to be strengthened. Um, so without the rule of law, we have nothing. We don't have an economy. We don't have trade. We don't have fairness or justice or health. Um, uh, and, and the work that you do in supporting Ukraine, I think, is an important contribution to trying to keep that balance fair uh, as part of the world order. So, so thanks very much for your attention. And if anyone has questions or uh, would like to discuss, obviously, I'm here. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Pearl. Any uh, direct questions? Because I noticed in the paper today, uh, the Gazette was talking about, about two groups. One was, I believe it's called Svoboda, which, is, uh, which was a, a, a Nazi party or a, right, a far right wing party in the country. And also there's a, a, a fighting battalion that is called uh, Azov, uh, which apparently is, is, is fighting on behalf of Ukraine. But is is a uh, is actually a, a, an extreme right wing uh, uh, group of, of hardened uh, hardened fighters. Uh, how does that uh, jive with uh, and and Ukraine? As you said, Ukraine has a history, certainly uh, during the, the Second War, of uh, of uh, anti semitism, uh, and uh, there's all kinds of monuments all over the country to leaders. Uh, uh, of that uh, of that period, uh, how would that affect them in the uh, in the in in the court's eyes? So, so this goes back to the point that I made earlier. Certainly, the the two groups that you mentioned, and Azov in particular, has has gotten a fair amount of uh, attention because they were also the group that was defending the steelworks uh, in Mariupol. Uh, 
Uh, so, so, you know, they very much come out of this with sort of a, a, a very different impression than the one we've had before. Look, the, the, the you know, as I said before, there is a long history of far right uh, groups that are operating in, in Ukraine and trying to get uh, trying to get political legitimacy. And a lot of them are have a militia or are militarized. Um, and and the international community, I think, in general, uh, is aware that these groups have existed. And because they do have uh, military capacity, there's no question that they've been drawn on. Uh, in order to to uh, accelerate the fighting. But that's a really different point than saying that these groups were perpetrating genocide. Okay, and so, and so, uh, and as I said earlier, you know, Canada has a history of having right wing groups, uh, including extremist right wing groups. Uh, in the United States, we had a, a relatively militarized uh, group of, of mainly uh, right-wing supporters who attacked Capitol Hill on January 6th of last year. Um, uh, I, I am not, I'm not aware of any principle of international law that would uh, allow us or anybody else to invade the United States uh, because of the existence of those groups, including, by the way, groups that have, you know, attempted to seditiously overtake uh, the U.S. and, and have histories and parts of their organization of anti-Semitism, racism, homophobia, uh, you know, Islamophobia, et cetera, et cetera. So, so the 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 narrow point here, uh, which is that you know, genocide is uh, the most serious international crime. It is the most serious human rights crime. It is the most serious international criminal law uh, crime, and its existence is what supports. The, or could support the potential intervention by a country like Russia. And indeed, uh, that appears to be what Russia, for the reasons I just outlined to you, um, uh, used to justify its own intervention. Uh, the, the, the denazification piece uh, really, uh, it, like, like many forms of propaganda, is grounded in some truth, but then it's leveraged or bootstrapped in a way that attempts to justify the much larger claim of genocide, which I don't think exists. So, you know, and, and, and coming back to the point about truth and fairness, I think it's important to acknowledge, as, as you just did, Jim, that these two other groups exist and they have a long history and it is cause for concern. Uh, but does it does it uh, justify what has happened and what has been unleashed on Ukraine? I think the answer is equivocal, unequivocally no. unmute myself there. Notwithstanding the fact that uh, Russia will deny everything that uh, is alleged anyway, and uh, will will protract this war in, until somebody probably uh, goes after it militarily. Uh, what kind of proof or what kind of actions can the international court get together? How much proof does it take to uh, to 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 put to put it up into Russia's face and say you are completely completely wrong and to convince everybody, including a lot of Russians, that this is the truth. So so there's sort of two layers to that question. One of them is what the state itself has been doing, and the other one is um, bringing to justice individuals before the International Criminal Court. Um, which will have some challenges because of the fact that uh, one of the venues for bringing these cases to the ICC is uh, the support of the Security UN Security Council, and Russia will, of course, veto uh, veto that. But certainly, in terms of the ICJ and potentially other ways of getting cases uh, of individual criminal responsibility, um, there are burdens of proof that um, are used before before um, before all of these bodies that that assess essentially whether it's more likely than not uh, in front of the ICJ and a slightly higher burden of proof before the ICC uh, that whether these events have taken place. So I mentioned the Bucha massacre a moment ago. Um, uh, at the, the, way that, the way that massacres are documented is uh, in part through the way the Bucha massacre itself was documented. So you have uh, firsthand witnesses who provide uh, affidavit evidence uh, supported by witness statements to the investigating body. Uh, those witness statements are brought together. They look at things like um, insignias, uniform information, 
uh, of the perpetrators? What did the uniforms look like? Uh, was there any evidence uh, of, uh, for example, munitions uh, or ballistics that support that it was, for example, uh, a weapon that was in the possession of one side uh, or uh, and not the other. First-hand witnesses that identify particular individuals that are responsible. Um, documentary evidence, uh, for example, that shows that particular orders are given uh, or that particular groups are given uh, a, a very free hand to do what they need to do to uh, secure territory and to terrify the population. Um, the Genocide Convention has a specific set of rules in it uh, regarding both the act of genocide, which includes evidence of killings, uh, serious harm, um, um, forcible transfer of children, uh, and creating uh, physical situations where human life is, is not sustainable. For example, loss of water, food, uh, exposure to elements, and so on. So elements of most of these have been, have been uh, made out in this particular case, um, and, and evidence would need to be brought forward on a systematic basis at a larger scale once people get access to the country, which they don't have now. Uh, and the second piece of this is intention. You also need to show that there's an intention uh, to eliminate the group. And so some of the things I talked about earlier that speak to that intention, the idea that Ukraine doesn't have a legitimate national identity, that Ukrainians themselves are subhuman, um, that they should be somehow eradicated, um, or the groups of them should be eradicated, uh, documents that show uh, a concerted military effort to eliminate the Ukrainian state, these are all things that would go to uh, or allow for an inference around the, the question of intent. And so that's the way that these kinds of things uh, are, are made out. And we have, we have lots of experience uh, in the international law community in doing this kind of work. So I was involved in, in what happened in Rwanda after the genocide. It was a similar kind of exercise, although very different circumstances. The International Criminal Tribunal of, of Yugoslavia um, had, had similar measures. Uh, Sierra Leone, where I, I haven't worked, but they also had an international um, uh, criminal law kind of process that went on. So, so that's the way in which it's done. And as I said before, it's a long process. It may take years, but things like this provisional judgment that I just talked about um, are really the first steps in preparing a foundation for uh, bringing forward prosecutions later on. And of course, you know, it's not it's not a done deal. There's a process you have to go through, and uh, the evidence needs to be brought to bear. And I presume this will most of this will will come to fruition after the war is ended. Yeah, it's it's really I think that's right. I, you know, I, I it's very it's, it's very difficult and mm -hmm. and dangerous uh, actually to to you know to have uh, folks doing forensic work go into the field when there are so many ongoing uh, and immediate um, needs in terms of military needs. Uh, and, and so on. I know, you know, there are people who are in the field, including actually a former classmate of ours, Dan Bielak, who um, was a Ukrainian Canadian, who I, I just found out last week is in the field. And he's actually, uh, he, he's actually uh, one of the people behind a challenge that's just been issued against the Canadian government for providing that turbine you may have heard about in the news uh, that has gone to the Germans. Um, in order to to uh, repair the turbine to make the pipeline work, um, th that is now being contested before the courts. And and you know again, it's going to be very difficult um, uh, you know to look at the broader context until this, the the uh, hostilities have have ceased. But pressure on Canadian government, on liberal democracies everywhere, to make sure that support and succor given to the Russia is minimized, I think is also important an important part of this. And that doesn't need to wait until hostility stop. Uh, you know, that's pressure that can be brought to bear now. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions? And speak up if you will, or put your hand up. On that note, then, uh, thank you very much, Pearl. The, Not at all. It's, it's uh, well, how, how, how would I say it? I, I guess like everybody's been so involved in, in watching uh, the, the news and, and seeing the bombs explode and, and the, the whole military aspect uh, of this thing and not realizing maybe uh, how much legal activity or uh, actions are, are, are being taken in, in the background. Uh, and although they may not be uh, particularly uh, out in front or important right now, 
it's going to be extremely important later on that this stuff is all documented and, and that there's people actually exactly. taking, taking a look at this thing. Yeah. So uh, thank you very much for bringing that to our attention. Uh, and I would recommend to everybody, uh, if you want to go on uh, YouTube and look up uh, Pearl Eliadis, I tell you, you'll find some very interesting and short uh, commentaries uh, that uh, I highly recommend. That's very kind. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you so much. All right. Bye-bye.